Uh, so a little background about me and what we're going to talk about today is a little bit about just a career in entrepreneurship. I've done all sorts of different things and I've started all sorts of different businesses and I'll give you some examples. But really a, a career in entrepreneurship is something that most people don't think of as a career. Maybe I'm going to start a business, but I've started multiple businesses. Some of them were horrible failures and I'll talk about some of those today to give you some insights on uh, what that can look like. And most of them were never traditional businesses. But it's just to give you an idea of the power of entrepreneurship and how to really think about growing a business and specifically bootstrapping will be the sort of main theme of our conversation today. So in terms of entrepreneurship, uh, my first business, uh, my first idea of starting an entrepreneurship started when I read these two books. When I was 19, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, followed by The E-Myth. And I highly recommend uh, these books to anyone who wants to go in this path, specifically E-Myth if you've already started a business. It helps sort of organize your thoughts as to how you could uh, grow and formulate a business. And so these have been really eye-opening for me and that's what really led down the path of uh, entrepreneurship. My first business I started uh, with a couple friends. We ended up moving to Florida. Uh, we were in the telecom business. That didn't really work out too, too well. Um, but when I was in Florida, I then had the opportunity to start a second business. Someone asked me to help them export cars from Florida to Kazakhstan. And so we set up a business to try to export cars. That actually never worked. We never sold one car, but we had set up everything, all the paperwork. And it was like a fun experience of learning how to just learn about different business and different business segments. I ended up really liking Florida, so I went to school down there. And I started my very first retail business. Uh, these flying saucers, I uh, found them on a website in Alibaba in 2003, which at the time wasn't really a popular website. And I took all my student loan money and sent it to China to buy these flying saucers and then shipped 10,000 of those to my mom's basement in New Brunswick while I was living in Florida to start my first real company. My mom called me and she said, why, what is going on, what are you doing? And I filled the entire house full of boxes of these units. I then started to sell them in the mall during uh, Christmas break, during the holidays, while I was at school. And we ended up making 35000 in sales in three weeks. And at that time, I knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur for the rest of my life. And so the next business that I started was the belt buckle business. The company was called Belts and Beyond. And one of my best friends told me, he always knew that I'd be doing something beyond this business, which is what happened. But I just started while I was at school as a school project selling belts and belt buckles. Everyone always asks like, oh, why are you doing belt buckles? Did you like belt buckles? No, it was just good profit margins. You could buy a buckle for $2 and you could sell it for $30, $40. And this actually took off this business. We went from two kiosks to 13 kiosks all across the country in Canada, to growing this business to 30 employees all across Canada while I was going to school as a side project. And then we became one of the biggest belt buckle retailers in North America. This is a random business that I got started in. One of the best things that ever happened to me is my business partner in this business was in software. And so he told me, you know, we should really do something in software at some point. And that was sort of a guiding principle. And eventually, the recession happened in 2008. Our sales crashed by 50%. And then I had to do something else. So to Barry's point, I got asked to solve a problem. So all the other businesses that I had ever done, I was sort of copying someone else's business idea and then doing it again. This business was the first time, or this concept, or this problem was the first time that I actually wanted to solve a problem that existed in the marketplace. And someone asked me to help them hire 200 people. And if you do the math about how much work it is to hire 200 people, you normally would have to go through 10,000 resumes, 6,000 phone screens, or 2,000 phone screens, depending on your criteria, 
hundreds of interviews in person. This was pre-COVID. Reference checks, profile tests, and hiring. And this insurance company asked me to hire these people in five years. And all I did was run a thought exercise of how could I do this in 30 days? How could I do what they're asking me to do in five years in 30 days? And that's where the idea really came for launching my business and launching VidCruder. Our first website was, uh, we don't use this logo anymore. This is like our first version. I always like showing this sort of cool logo. But it was really from this point on that I really got started. And so my career in entrepreneurship in uh, tech started in 2009. And so one of the first things that I always tell entrepreneurs that are starting in tech is to make sure to have proper vesting schedules for you and your co-founders. During those first two, three years, I went through seven different co-founders on the technical side of the business because not all of them wanted to be career entrepreneurs. That takes a certain kind of personality. And so the saving grace was that I didn't get, split the company 50-50 with every single partner that I had. Because if so, we wouldn't have really been able to launch. So if you have a startup or you're planning a startup, I highly recommend, if you can, to restructure your vesting schedule, even if you're only two people, to make sure that everyone has to stay involved in the business to keep getting their shares and ownership. Even if you're 50-50. If that person leaves tomorrow, you're sort of stuck, and then you need to go get another co-founder, and then it's, not, it's very difficult to claw back those shares and give them to someone else, especially when the business is just getting started. So that's one of the things that I highly recommend. We did this, the two of us, part-time for three years. During this time, I didn't know anything about tech. I didn't know anything about HR. So I was working three part-time jobs. I was teaching at university bartending, and selling medical supplies to hospitals, all while just trying to get my startup off the ground. And eventually, we got started and started to launch the business. Another thing that you'll often hear about starting a business is people always talk about product market fit. That's one of the core competencies that you need to do when launching a product. I launched an automated hiring platform. If you go to a recruiter, and ask them, hey, would you like to buy an automated hiring platform? They're going to say no, because it automates their job. They have no intention in automating their job. Even though it's a great business idea to solve the problem, I wasn't actually talking to the user. And so it took about a year or so of talking to a lot of clients and getting feedback to really understand what the problem was. We didn't have product market fit not because the product was wrong, but because we were selling it or marketing it in the wrong way. And so all we did over time was learn to adapt our marketing and sales presentation to what the market actually wanted to buy. We never stopped building the product. The product today is the same that it was when we started. It hasn't changed. The marketing and sales was the key component that we changed in terms of how we message how the product can work. And the biggest epiphany that I had was to break down the product into different modules. And so we have what's called an applicant tracking system. We do video interviewing, asynchronous and synchronous. We do automated reference checking. We do automated scheduling. We do automated skill testing. And each one of those is a different automated product that automates a different stage of the recruitment process. But when you buy it, you're buying an automated hiring platform. And so we were able to just tweak our messaging to make sure that each person could buy what they wanted to automate that stage without giving them a full suite and scaring them away from their job. So that's a key point in terms of validation from clients is you may have built something that people want and you may just not be explaining it properly to those specific groups or people. So that's an example of just initial stages of the business. The second thing that I often uh, talk to founders is, should you bootstrap your business or not? What does bootstrapping mean? At the time when I started VidCritter, we bootstrapped out of necessity. It wasn't because I wasn't trying to fundraise. I was trying to fundraise all the time, all the time, all the time. 
And what would happen is people would assume that I didn't know anything about HR and I didn't know anything about tech because I was a belt buckle guy. And they were partially right. I didn't really know that much at the time. But I did spend three years or 10,000 hours analyzing the market and getting really good. So I assumed that people would understand how much time I put into it. And everything I read online was about how you needed to fundraise. You always needed to fundraise. You always needed to fundraise. And so I was just in the mindset that I had to go and fundraise. We ended up, for the most part, bootstrapping this business even till today. And the major thing that I recommend to people is don't assume that you do need to fundraise. And I'll talk about different fundraising tactics today. But that was the, the best experience or the, one of the best things that happened to our company was that we didn't actually get in, in any venture capital or institutional investments at the beginning because we weren't ready. And so now, at the time though, we were doing 100,000 in sales and venture capitalists would call us. And we weren't even qualified to get funding from them. A lot of venture capitalists have rules where they have to, your revenue has to be above a certain threshold to even be able to invest in your business. And those rules are set up by their LPs. It's not that they don't want to invest in your business. They can't. And oftentimes they won't tell you that they can't. They'll just say you're not qualified or your business isn't good enough or something like that. But they actually can't even invest into your company because your revenue is not even high enough. And so I highly recommend for as long as you can to bootstrap. And we bootstrap for quite a long time. And I had all sorts of different bootstrapping strategies I'm going to share with you today on how to bootstrap your business if that's something that you want to. And so it did take quite a long time or a little bit longer to get to 2 million in sales than most other companies, but it was a blessing in disguise because we got really, really good at learning how to grow this business. And so the main theme today is to share with you different bootstrapping strategies on how to grow your business without traditional investors. So one of the first things that we did is that a lot of employees were paid a little bit lower salaries and we hired a lot of junior people. But what we did to compensate them with was to pay them on equity. Every single employee at VidCritter has stock options in our business. And the people that started at the beginning could choose to get paid in shares or options and cash. And that was a huge benefit to our business because I did, I do have a cap table with a lot of people and we have a lot of people that have stock options, but all of a sudden everyone was part owner into the business. Some companies don't always give shares to staff and we highly recommend if you can to just do it. The trick, which is at the, it's coming on the next slide is to have proper valuations so that everyone's on the same page with what those shares are worth and that they can take them or sell them or, or, or go away with them if you, they don't work with you anymore. So that they're not just working for free. And a lot of the people that, we gave, that worked with me, we gave them shares that are still shareholders today. Some of those are founder shares and some of those are stock options. But I think I have 15 different people that have founder shares. And I could just pay them with that. And they would work quite hard. And we didn't have high salaries. Another thing that we did in terms of cost reduction, which is more popular today, there's deal and other products that you can use, but we started an offshore team in 2012 when we had four Canadian employees. Our fifth employee was someone in the Philippines. And so we just hired her on Indeed, tried her to, to start working with us, and she did a phenomenal job. We then hired her brother, her cousin, her husband, her friends, and we now have 120 employees in the Philippines that all work directly for our business. They run our finance department. They run part of our marketing team. They work on our sales team. They work on our customer success team. They work on our applicant success team. They, they run all sorts of different operations within our organization. And so we're a 200 person company, which also looks really good on LinkedIn for clients who want to, you know, think about how big our company is of which 120 of those people work in all different countries all around the world. And so you don't have to wait a long time or be a big company to hire offshore resources and staff. You could just post a job on Indeed and start recruiting and have that person work with you. A lot of countries are set up to work overnight. So these, all these people work our shifts and they dramatically help our business. And so I highly recommend that you start an offshore operations as soon as possible. 
all of our development is still done in Canada. A lot of people talk about offshoring dev. We wanted to keep the development in Canada, but every single person has someone who takes notes on calls, writes emails for them, writes the proposals for them, does data research for them, data research on our competitors. We have a plethora of all sorts of reports that come every day from all different teams. It has now become a BPO and we have our own internal BPO into our operations. And so that is a dramatic way to save costs without having to spend a lot of money that helps you bootstrap your business. We also focused on inbound marketing a lot. We realized in Moncton, we weren't gonna find a lot of software sales experience people. And so we went and became the best in the world at getting clients, not in our local geography. And so the number one thing that I can recommend and a lot of other mentors that have recommended is try to get 10 clients that aren't affiliated to any sort of, this person will become your client because they know you, this kind of thing. You need to build your business where your first 10 clients are not in any way, shape or form, have any reason to buy from you. There's no friend, there's no connection. One of our first key clients was in Australia. And that was huge for all of our team because we were able to prove that we could get clients anywhere around the world. We didn't need to go in person to talk to them. We could do it all over the phone and in video conferencing. And so that it is, if you can focus on making sure that you don't, so a lot of people get caught up in trying to get clients. Like if you live in Toronto, get clients in Toronto because it's easier. You can talk to them. The thing is that will give you false hope that your business is actually doing really well because once you pass that threshold of those clients that you've got within your sphere of influence, you won't be able to keep growing the business the same way. And then you have to readapt to your go-to market strategy. Another thing we did is make sure that we had the cheapest possible office and the cheapest possible rent. We had a like 200 square foot office with no windows in the middle of a building that was like a C-class building. And when we had a couple of clients that wanted to come visit us. That office, you would not buy from our company if you came into that office and visited us. And so what we did is when those clients wanted to come, we temporarily expanded our office in a nicer place with much nicer facilities. All of our interns came in for that period of time and the office was full of people. And then the client left and we went back to our little 100 square foot office because it's very rare that clients would even come visit us at that time. Now it's almost unheard of, but office rent is one of your most expensive costs in a business. And so you wanna keep that as low as possible. To give you an idea, we were paying about $2,000 a month for 10,000 square feet. That's what we ended up getting to at the end. So it was dramatically cheaper. Now we have like a nicer office, but that was things that we did. We also got free furniture. You shouldn't be spending money on furniture for your business. A lot of landlords have furniture left over. We found a landlord that uh, had rented space to Exxon Mobil, and they had these Harmon Miller chairs, and we got 100 Harmon Miller chairs for free. We paid nothing for them. And so this exists. You just got to go and have the resources. And if you think about your time allocation, it took me 10 hours to contact a bunch of landlords and then find some free stuff and get that furniture. Buying a chair or an office desk or whatever will cost you $100. And I had to buy 10 of them. Well, I made $100 an hour getting free furniture, which expanded. And now we have still those chairs left over for the staff. So if you think about dollars per hour in terms of your time, it was a huge time savings to do that kind of stuff. The other thing that we started doing is all of our staff would have a computer with a nice monitor, but it's not productive to have one monitor. You need to have two, three, four, five monitors, whatever your number is. I have five every day now. So one of our guys saw a flyer in a pawn shop that you could, they were selling monitors. So we went to the pawn shop and got monitors for $10. And so we'd walk in and buy 50 at a time. And so I bought hundreds and hundreds of monitors over the years at $10 each just to save money. We also had taking a lot of chances on younger people, interns, lots of interns. At one point we had 20 interns in an organization that had 10 employees. And so we would just give everyone a chance. Everyone could try. Everyone had a chance to work with us. Some of those interns have become directors and running departments in our organization now. And so these are examples of things that you can do to save money. Other things that we did, which are super important and may not seem obvious, is we started to follow Saster. For those of you who may or may not know, it's Jason Lemkin. 
in Moncton, there's no tech community. We're literally one of the only tech companies in our city. And in the province, there's like two or three like major tech companies. And so we, I personally plugged in to everyone in Silicon Valley, every Twitter feed, everything that was going on. And I would actually end up learning more about what's going on in San Francisco than what was happening in Moncton, my own city. But what I ended up doing was sharing that knowledge and sharing everything I was learning with my team in terms of how to run a tech company. What is everyone doing to run their tech company? What are all the tricks? What are they doing? And I told everyone, follow all the top VPs of marketing of all the biggest tech companies. Sales, follow all the top sales guys. Partnerships, follow all the top partnerships guys. They're sharing their knowledge of how they're running their business. And you get to plug in into these experts and download that information into, in this case, a lot of these people were interns, to learn how to become experts all of a sudden. And whenever we needed to get an intern to get leveled up even more, we would just get a very short contract. A lot of organizations will do short contracts for CFOs. You'll hear, oh, get a part-time CFO, get a partial CFO. Most organizations don't do that for that uh, too many other roles. Every role in your organization should have someone who's an expert that hopefully you're not paying them too much and hopefully they're not taking too much equity in your business. You can do that in a different way and I'll explain that in a second. But that you get those experts consultants that come in and help you really guide you as to what you need to do how to grow your business and making sure that you're saving money in terms of not having to hire those people until you're really ready. Plus it gives you a, a way to test those people out to see if they're actually good at what they say they're going to do. And then you make sure that contract has an end period. Never want to sign a mentor or an advisor or an expert for more than 30 days. If they're not the right person, it's super complicated to fire an executive or someone really senior. You want to have super short contracts. The other thing that I did that was really crucial to our business, which was again against the grain of what I had heard in the market, was financing rounds. So I did try to get a lot of financing. And everyone at the beginning would say, when is your round closing? When is your round closing? And I was like, what does that mean? Okay, well, I'm going to have a close date. So I went to one of my mentors at the time, and I said, I've got $100,000 of investors and we're trying to raise 500,000. But I don't think I'm going to be able to hit that target by the close date because there you know there's not that many people in in Moncton that invest in tech companies. And I hadn't taken their money yet. And the what he told me which was crucial, he said, if you have an investor that wants to write you a check and you're waiting on some fictional date in the future that's a close date, don't do that. Put the money into your bank account as soon as possible and run your business with that money today. And forget about this concept of a closed date. I ended up raising $1.2 million round from angel investors. That round took me five years to close. And the benefit there was that I had not a big chunk of money all at once in my bank account. If I did, I would have probably spent it in stupid ways. What I ended up doing is raising every quarter or every six months, 100,000, 200,000, another 100,000 here, another 200,000 there. And what I would do is I would go to the government, whether it was IRAP or ACOA or here, the province of Ontario. And every time I'd get a little bit of money, I'd try to get the government to subsidize or match that with some kind of matching program. Every province has different programs that you can plug into and they like it when you get a small little bit of money. And so I ended up matching more than the money that I got from investors and the government can only give you so much so that I keep doubling up on my money all the time for the business. And so this concept of closing rounds, you don't really need to follow it if you don't want to. It's just, it's just a thing. And so all I did to make sure that that round that lasted five years would still work is once a year we'd get a valuation report. And you saw the sales numbers, they didn't change that much. So for the most part, everyone still paid the same price per share. The price per share didn't really change that much. In terms of valuation reports, there's a company called Scalar. They're in Utah. It's $2,000. KPMG quoted me $30,000. Do not use, do not pay that much for those kinds of reports. And for the most part, your business hasn't changed dramatically when you're bootstrapping and there's not that many things that are changing. And so the angels just keep investing in that round, but there's no end date to the round. So that was a key differentiation in terms of our funding 
that really made a difference into being able to grow the business. And so what has that turned into? All of these tricks and these hacks that we did to grow the business as in from today, today VidCruiter is used by some of the biggest companies in the world. We sell to all sorts of organizations. They range from Bell to Pepsi to the government of Canada and all sorts of companies. And really, we've been fortunate to, to be in the business for long enough that we were able to solve all the different problems that we had. From 2020 to 2023, we grew by 500% our staff. We went from 40 to 200 people, of which all around the world, about 80 of them are in Canada, the rest offshore, and our business is still 80% owned by employees. That includes our founders and everyone. That's one of the most pride, the, the, in terms of pride that I have for the business, that our staff owns the company is really important for me. We ended up selling 20% to angel investors, but it made a huge difference. And now, when they we're at this stage, we get venture capitalists calling us every single day. I get between three and 10 emails from different organizations who want to invest in our business every single week. And it's flipped. And so I could, and I, we, we might do a deal with a VC. We're talking to a few organizations. Some of them are here today. But we, we've had now the opportunity to do it on our terms. We're not stuck. We're not doing multiple rounds, the ABC soup of whatever you're reading about. We can do it on our terms with the right partner that wants to go in the right way with us. We've grown our revenue by 300%, and we're currently growing at 40% year over year. So, but we're still buying monitors from pawn shops. So that's the one thing that I wanted to share with you in terms of bootstrapping and the strategy around bootstrapping. Not that many companies do this. I recommend that you do this for as long as you can possibly afford to. It is difficult. For the most part, I was paying myself like $50,000 a year for 10 years, and I had to bootstrap. But and working like crazy all the time, you have to be a little bit, you have to be really motivated. But now we're able to have our staff control our fate. And it's been a life-changing experience for me.